microphone. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> good to see you here tonight. Ready for church this evening. And uh, good to see you here tonight. Let's start by singing together 322, shall we? It's stand up, stand up for Jesus. So let's do that. Let's all stand and we'll sing together 322. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Keep singing tonight. Good to see you in church and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us this evening. And I appreciate you being faithful and being in your place. Let's open with prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you now this evening and Lord, we do ask you to meet with us tonight. You know what we need during the middle of the week and thank you for each one that's uh, made the effort to come and gather with the people of God here tonight. And Lord, we come where the only attraction is, we'll sing the songs of God and we'll open up the word of God and we'll get to be with the people of God and uh, you promised that you'd be here, Lord, and we need you tonight. And so, Lord, help us this evening and may you be pleased with the, the songs. May we sing with melody in our heart as unto you. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless the prayer time together this evening and hear the prayers that we bring before thee. And then, Lord, open understanding that we would behold some truths from your word tonight that will help us and strengthen us and we'll be better servants for thee. We love you. We pray you'll, you'll speak to our hearts now and use this service for your honor and glory. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. Turn with me if you would to number 510, 510. Whosoever meaneth me. I am happy today and the sun shines bright. 510 on that first together. I am happy today and the sun shines bright. The clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior said, whosoever will may come with him to sing. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me.
Tonight's letters from the Radabals, missionaries to the deaf in South Africa. Dear friends in Christ, in the Old Testament, Job asked the question, how then can man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? It seems this question has been asked by people throughout history, evidenced by the multitude of religions that attempt to provide some remedy for the problem this question identifies. Not far from where we live is the largest Muslim mosque in the Southern Hemisphere. It can accommodate up to 6,000 men and women with a school, market, clinic, and planned university in Islamic studies. We encounter Muslims on a day-to-day -day basis and pray for their salvation. Islam is one of the religions that has tried to answer Job's question. The five, the five pillars of Islam are designed so that a Muslim can try to provide their God with enough good works in hopes that he will be compelled to save them. One of the young ladies in the deaf church has a Muslim boyfriend. She brought him to some of our special events and he was quick to let everyone know I am a Muslim. That didn't stop our people from showing him love and encouragement. Evidently this had an effect on him because he came with her to church a few times and our people continued to show him love and encouragement. In September he asked to talk and we had the opportunity to give a clear presentation of the gospel. He did not come to Christ, but he was interested. He just needed time to consider what he had heard. In October, we planned a special day to reach the lost, and our college students presented the drama, The Final Judgment. At the conclusion of the service, he asked again to talk. We took him to a counseling room, and as the door was closed, the first words from his mouth were, I need to be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord, he came to Christ that day. We carefully explained to him that to come to Christ is to leave Islam. You cannot be a Christian and a Muslim. He understood and asked Jesus to save him, that he was leaving Islam for Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord Job asked the question, and thank the Lord that Paul provided the answer. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. We planned an outreach for the Tishwani Deaf Baptist Church to help them reach out the lost in Pretoria. Once again, our college group presented the drama, The Final Judgment. Praise the Lord for the response to the invitation to accept Christ as Savior as 12 deaf came to Christ. In September, we made another trip to Lesotho with some of our college students. The Lord gave us the opportunity to present the final judgment drama and 10 deaf wanted to trust Christ as their Savior. Praise the Lord for an opportunity to serve him. Please be in prayer for Lesotho, as there is no church for the deaf in the whole country. We are praying that the Lord would use one of our men to meet the need. We now come to a, the end of another college year, and we'll have the joy of seeing three deaf men and two deaf ladies graduate this coming Saturday. We have spent countless hours with them in training, in guidance, and in mentoring, and giving them the opportunity for practical experience. We now come to the place where they finish their time with us and they launch out into the area of ministry to which God has called them. This week is Thanksgiving Day and we want to thank you for your part in their training. Your prayers and faithful support enable us to continue reaching the lost and training the saved. The Raider Balls. Amen. That's a great job, isn't it? Man, I really enjoyed reading that letter and they're doing a great job there in South Africa. I remember so impressed when they came and reported in and talked about what God was doing there, and uh, that's exciting. That's good good stuff. Brother Jarvis, I want you to come for a moment, if you would, and uh, some of you may aware, may, some of you may not be aware, uh, but uh, his uh, Adam and Elisa down in Honduras, uh, their Tanner, their two-year-old, uh, stepped off, a, coming out of a room and missed a step, not a big step, but just, just one of these just uh, unexplainable things, and he broke his femur. And uh, they got him in the hospital there in Honduras and uh, some decisions and such. In fact, I probably had surgery by now, but I want Brother Jack to kind of update everybody as far as what you where we are at this time, if you would, Brother Clark. Um, as Pastor was saying, there was, a, there was actually the step was about that thick, and he just 
uh, missed, fell, fell, fell strangely in the upper, the femurs, the upper bone, which is, um, uh, that's, that's dangerous for a young uh, child because it broke in it and it, it shifted so that they had to uh, uh, put a titanium pin in. Uh, now, that was, uh, they made that decision, all this is within the last day or so on, and actually the surgery is going on as we, as we t sitting here right now. So uh, he's, uh, hopefully that, you know, and, and, and those of you who know anything about surgery or whatever, little children and anesthesia, you gotta be very, very careful, and, and that's a third world country, and we've already had people warn us about that and, and uh, warn him, you know, well, anyway. So, uh, but point is that, uh, you know, God, is the one who heals. It's not a great doctor there or that bad doctor there. God's gonna heal either one he wants to. So um, we just look at, uh, he, he uh, Adam and I, we, we just, we talked about this and uh, of course we, we have this uh, way we, we kind of text back and forth. We occasionally talk, uh, that's a little more expensive, but um, and that, that the point is that, that God one's in control. And you know, uh, God is, as far as having a situation, you're in a bad place, they didn't have a car, they, you know, it was like this bad accident and, and it was a, and the hospital, the first hospital they went to, the Elisa sent clean sheets along because they don't always have clean sheets in it, give you an idea about the hospital there. And then they ended up transferring to another hospital, but the impossible, that's what God, that's, that's what he Amen. does, is the impossible. So this is just ready for God. He knows what to do with these kind of things. So we're looking forward to what God's gonna do. I'm going to pray for little Tanner. Tanner's two years old, all right? And so uh, keep him in your prayers tonight. And then we uh, want to remember the folks out in San Bernardino who lost loved ones uh, this afternoon. Uh, if you're not aware of that, that happened about 2 o'clock our time. And uh, I think just uh, here between 6 and 7, they may have captured the suspects it looked like they had found a, a vehicle and a couple of them had tried to run and such so not sure what that's all about but we do know 14 people have lost their life and uh, there's about 17 others who are in the hospital in various stages of of uh, hurt and so uh, we want to pray for pray for the folks out there and pray that God will use this God will use this to get the attention of Americans we 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 need to give God our attention and uh, so we want to pray for those situations this evening, all right? Well, take your prayer guide, if you would. You got that handy there. Anybody need one? Anybody not get one when you came in? All right, great job. And, uh, of course, we'll start with the coming events. And uh, remember the CRC uh, at the prison tomorrow night uh, down at uh, uh, Orient. And then... We have a Friday night RU right here at 7 o'clock at the church and men's breakfast Saturday morning at 8.15. Fellows, remember that. Looking forward to that, uh, being together with the fellows on Saturday morning to decorate the church around 9.30 and then our bus and soul winning visitation at 10. And then on the 13th, remember the children's Christmas play will be at 5.45 that Sunday evening. Uh, we've switched to caroling from the 12th to the 19th. So make a note of that, would you? We're going to go on the 19th from 10 to noon and uh, bring some cookies to share, and we'll also probably come back and have some uh, sloppy joes and chips and things along with those cookies, all right? So that'll be on Saturday the 19th, and uh, the children children have to practice their play on Saturday morning the 12th. So uh, that makes it a long day for them if they come for all of that. So we'll, we'll, we'll move for, for them, all right? And um, let's see. Uh, on the... Other requests, well, the, the spiritual growth and restoration, pray for those needs if you would. Um, remember the church ministries and such that the Lord has allowed us to, to have here. And then uh, pray, of course, for the different folks on our health list. And uh, go ahead and add um, uh, Jeanette Anderson onto that. It's, um, she may have a pinched nerve in her neck. And uh, also possible, is that right, possible ulcers in the stomach? And so getting some results tomorrow uh, on that. Is that right, Jeanette? So we'll find out about that tomorrow. So please pray for Jeanette. The other um, added thing to that is she flies out to California tomorrow. So uh, how long will you be in California? For a week, okay. So uh, pray for Jeanette as she travels. Pray for safety. Um, these are... 
In fact, you're flying to Southern California, aren't you? Yes, you are, okay? So I uh, pray for Jeanette, both physically and uh, for her safety as she flies out there to spend some time with uh, Anthony and his wife and the grandchildren, okay? That would be great. Okay, and then, of course, praying for those who are in authority and um, our military personnel and those who are battling cancer. And we're praying for the salvation of these folks on our list, uh, that the Lord will see, uh, send somebody across their path, that they'll receive Christ as their Savior. And then the unreached people groups of the world. And we continue to pray for God to send forth laborers into uh, the unreached people groups of the world. And then our missionaries. Uh, highlighted tonight by the Radabaws, the good report we've heard from them down in South Africa. And, of course, we want to make sure we pray for Tanner uh, Jarvis and uh, the surgery that he'll go through, that God will oversee the whole, the whole thing. You know, Tanya texted me, and she said she got a text from, uh, I, think it, I think they kind of have a family text thing, and uh, she said Adam texted in his text. He said, God is a good God. He does good things. And she said it brought tears to her eyes to hear her brother say that. She's heard her dad say that a lot. <laughs> but it's something else when, you're, when your children grab a hold of that and say it to you. It was a real blessing. So uh, let's uh, remember that as we go to prayer tonight. All right. Brother Wallace, I want you to come, if you would, and I want you to lead us in our prayer this evening. And uh, let's pray along with Brother Bob as he leads us audibly. Pray along with him silently. And let's lift up these requests we've mentioned this evening. Brother Bob. Father, we thank you for being that great God. And Father, we desire <coughs> individually as a church and as a church to lift you up and to exalt you and to uh, praise you for what you're going to do in, uh, in these uh, prayer requests. And Lord, uh, uh, when we can lift you up, when we can exalt you, Father, it's... Uh, that's what it's all about. And Father, we trust you. You're always faithful. And Lord, help us to be faithful and not to forget to uh, continually lift these people up when you bring them to our mind and our heart. And Father, we do pray for all the missionaries that uh, are on the field that are spreading the gospel. Not only the ones that we support, but all over the world that we have no idea the great work that uh, God is doing. And, Lord, we uh, just uh, uh, ask that your, your mighty hand would be upon uh, each and every uh, family, each and every situation, and that, Lord, you will shine like a, uh, the brightness of your glory would shine in all these uh, works that are going on for you. Lord, we do lift uh, little Tanner up to you. Father, we know that uh, your hand is great, that you're the great physician. We do know that... Uh, it, it is in your hands and Lord we believe by faith that uh, after this is all said and done that all will be well just like the woman who had the son who ran towards the prophet and said all is well and by confidence we know that all will be well Father we pray for Stacy that you would help her in her physical condition and Lord I just pray that that will continue to improve as the days go by I do pray for Jean Jeanette as she travels to California, give her safety. Lord, then uh, take care of these uh, uh, tumors or whatever they are. Father, you know. Many times in the past, we've got uh, reports back where someone has uh, uh, had a condition and we've prayed for them. And Lord, you've been such a good God. And the report would come back that uh, uh, the, the, the situation couldn't be found. The tumors couldn't be found. The cancer couldn't be found. Lord, we trust that the... We'll get the same report uh, when Jeanette goes in to see the doctors. And, Lord, we just leave it in your hands. Father, we uh, want to thank you for our church, for how you're working here. Lord, uh, we are nothing without you. And, Lord, uh, uh, your word is so good. I, I was thinking as Pastor was preaching in the last few days of Sunday and, and last Wednesday, Lord, about your word, how great your word is. And, uh, Lord, uh, we, we just uh, have nothing better to stand on. We have that great hope in your word. And, Lord, we uh, help us not to take it for granted. Help us to realize that uh, 
Lord, you are the great God of, of all. And Father, I, uh, I do want to pray for all the ministries here at our church. Lord, I do pray for the RU ministries. And Lord, uh, if you decide to tarry, Lord, I, I, I just know that uh, because it's your work that we're going to hear some great testimonies of people coming out of these uh, institutions. And Lord, uh, can uh, with confidence... Uh, give the testimonies that they are overcomers like uh, Brother Currington said after about six months I never look back I never look back Lord I, that's what we want to hear about people who are trying to serve you and grow in your word that they, they, uh, they, they've, they're confident that, that they'll never have to look back that they can always trust you in each and every situation now, Father as we gather in your house and we sing about uh, our, our Lord, Lord, I, I pray that as our pastor comes and opens up your word, uh, Father, that uh, we will be attentive to what you have to say. Uh, I, I recall about pastor preaching about Peter and when uh, Jesus said those words to him, that Peter, uh, you'll deny me. Uh, before the cock crows thrice, thrice you'll deny me. Those were a lot of words to say, but the word says that Jesus' word, the word that he spoke to Peter, it wasn't those words, it was the word that came straight from his mouth, from the Lord's mouth. Lord, I believe that you was, he knew that you was talking specifically, especially to him. And Father, I just pray that you would specifically, especially talk to each individual here tonight that, Lord, we will get something from your gracious word, that it will help us, that will encourage us, that will lift us up and help us dearly to shine for you. And, Father, we'll give you all the praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 228. 228 in your hymnal. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing He Hideth My Soul. 228 on that verse together. A wonderful Savior. our guests will come back and sing that last together.
with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his bonus divine i sing in my rapture oh glory to god for such a redeemer as last all together when we get to that chorus we're going to have lisa drop out uh really think about what we're singing that chorus is just the uh a perfect description of peace and just be thinking about that as we sing that uh, last chorus it's just it's amazing to uh, be able to sing about uh, the peace that we can have when we're truly in God's hand. Let's uh, sing that last together. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation is wonderful shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his seated. Ushers will come and they'll get our offering now tonight and uh, this is the first Wednesday night of the month and that's Yoder night okay and uh, this offering will go towards uh, Brother Dave and uh, the uh, trip he wants to take this spring and so uh, we'll take this in and that'll be set aside for that and uh, be generous uh, tonight be giving to them and uh, what this will go towards and the training of national pastors to do the work of the ministry and uh, it's exciting we have an opportunity to give. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for the privilege it's ours to give. And we do pray, Lord, that you'll provide for Brother Yoder as he plans to make this trip and uh, to go over to help and to train pastors. I pray, Lord, that uh, not only with what we give, though it would be wonderful to provide it, all of it through us, we'd be pleased if you could do that. But, Lord, we trust that you will provide the need. Uh, Lord, you're a good God. You do good things. And we are uh, in your hand, and we know that, and we're thankful for that. And so, Lord, we know that in, in your hand, you protect us, but you also provide for us. And we trust that you'll provide for this need for the Yoders. And we'll thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
I want you to go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, please. The, uh, the other thing that uh, wasn't mentioned but that uh, we want to try to help with uh, sometime here in the month of December, I'm thinking as part of our Christmas offering on December 20th, uh, would be that $1,700 for this operation uh, that Tanner needs to have. And now, obviously, that you can have operation for $1,700 in the United States, that's one thing, but uh, this $1,700 that comes right out of Adam and Alyssa's pocket. And so uh, we want to try to help with that need. And uh, so probably mark it down December 20th. We'll, part of our Christmas offering, if you want to designate uh, some of your offering to go towards that need, uh, then we'll send that on uh, to them. Brother Jarvis. Praise the Lord. Good. Amen. That's great. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you now for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for this good report we just received as Tanner has come through the surgery and he's doing well. And Lord, we, we give you the praise and you the honor for that. Thank you that you're a God who holds us in your hand. And Father, we love you. We thank you for being good to us and thank you for being good to the Jarvises. Lord, pray for a complete and uh, healing, uh, a quick recovery for this little fella. And Lord, I pray that this would be a great testimony to those who are watching Adam and Elisa go through this. And that, Lord, their, their trust and their faith in God would be seen by those who need to see it. And that you'd use this to be a powerful witness and a powerful testimony of your goodness and your grace. Now, Father, I pray that you'd open our eyes tonight as we come to study your word. Lord, we thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your words and we don't look at them tonight as just the words of men or the words of a man, but we believe them to be in truth, the words of God. And I pray that they would have authority and power in our life, and Lord, that we would listen to the word tonight and it would mix with faith, that it might profit those of us who hear it, and then help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, beginning in about verse, uh, let's see, I better get chapter 20, verse number 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know how, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock which, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. 
Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Paul took three missionary journeys, and in chapter 20, here he's about to begin his last missionary trip, uh, his third one. And in these verses, as he begins to head out, he's going to say goodbye to the saints at Ephesus, and particularly to the pastors of the churches there in Ephesus, and he is, it's really one of the most uh, heartwarming scenes you have in the Bible. Uh, these are folks who he loved and they loved him, and it was a very difficult goodbye uh, that they had. He literally opens up his heart. If you ever wanted to see inside the heart of the Apostle Paul, uh, here's where you would see it, as he bears his heart to people who love him and whom he loved. And so, we're going to look a little bit at Paul and, and see some attributes that he had and uh, that, that prayerfully we can have. Because probably outside of the Lord Jesus himself, there's no greater Christian that we are aware of, at least uh, that we, we are conscious of, that lived a better life than the Apostle Paul did. Uh, he was used of God to pen half our New Testament, and uh, he was a fine example. Uh, he could say, be ye followers of me even as I follow Christ and not many can make that statement and so Paul was able to do that but let's look and see what the attributes we find in Paul's heart the very first one I see is our theme for this month which is faithfulness and that's where we'll spend the majority of our time uh, in our study here this evening faithfulness Paul said in verse number 18 he when they were come to him he said to them ye know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Saying I, I started, uh, I hit the ground running, so to speak, as soon as I got here, the very first day I begin to uh, give you the gospel. And, and by the way, a difficult place. Not a, somebody says, oh, I, I wish I could serve in that place. That would be an easy place. I don't think there are any easy places. Uh, I think it's, I think, you know, when you're, when you're taking the gospel and you're taking the light into the dark places, it's just difficult everywhere. Uh, but you just stay faithful and you continue to shine the light and God honors his word as it goes forth. He was dependable. He never quit. He never backed off. He never gave up. We read, I think it was either Sunday morning or Sunday night, all the things from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that Paul went through. Uh, but he never let him stop him. He never, never pulled back. Never said, I think I need some time out. Uh, never said, I think I just need a little time off. Uh, he just kept right on rolling and kept right on being faithful. Faithfulness is the most important quality that you and I can cultivate in our heart and in our Christian life. And I appreciate, listen, I, I think I mentioned it the other day, but I appreciate the faithfulness of the people of God in this church. Uh, faithful to be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. It's, uh, people are amazed sometimes when they, when they listen to the Sunday morning attendance and then they hear how many are here on Sunday night and how many are on Wednesday night. Uh, it is not the usual. Uh, but listen, it ought to be the usual because faithfulness is faithfulness. So if there's three services and you're a member of that church, you ought to be faithful to the services of the church. And you ought to be in church. You ought to be faithful. Uh, faithful. If uh, I used to use, <laughs> date myself, I used to always use the delivery of the newspaper. I don't think anybody gets a newspaper delivered anymore. Does anybody still get a newspaper at home? Any of you old timers? Oh, several of you do, all right? And um, uh, most people look at it electronically or they don't even need a newspaper anymore because it's all old by the time the newspaper comes, you know? Um, but if, uh, let's take your car. Um, if you went out and tried to start your car and it started one out every three mornings, would you call that car? Yeah, there's Old Faithful. Uh, no, you'd have a few other names for it, but it wouldn't be Faithful. Uh, why? Because it doesn't start. It uh, only starts one out every three mornings. Well, then how if we come to church one out every three services are we considered Faithful? Wow, one, one woman said amen. Yeah. Huh? Come on now. Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. Aren't you glad you came tonight, huh? You know, faithful. 
Faithful is dependable. Faithful is reliable. Faithful is you can count on it. And, and, and you can cultivate that in, in your life. God give us more faithful, dependable people for his work. Faithfulness. There may be some things you can't do. Not everybody's going to be able to get up and sing. Okay? Now, just because you think you can doesn't mean you can Okay? I'm sorry. I, I know you want to make a joyful noise, but we may not want to listen to it. All right? So it's okay. And I, I sing your heart out in the shower, okay? And, uh, and let, the, let the Lord hear it. But, but not everybody's going to be able to get up and sing a special. Just accept that and say, that's, that's great. I'm glad there are people who can. Not everybody can play an instrument, okay? I'm glad that we have some people who can. Uh, and be thankful that, that you don't have somebody over there who can't play. Uh, you can, uh, if you've ever been in a, in a situation where somebody trying to play the piano who can't, it's, it's rather cringeworthy experience. And, and it's not real enjoyable. But I'm thankful there are people who can do that. I'm, not everybody can get up and teach. Not everybody can get up and teach and preach. Uh, through the years, you know, of 33 years of pastoring, boy, there's times people come in and they, they want to tell me as soon as they come into the church what a great teacher they are. Brother Yoder has never failed yet. Everybody who talks that way <laughs> just flat out can't, can't teach a lick, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and people end up, I, I give them a room, give them a class, and after about six weeks, eight weeks, three months, nobody's coming to their class. It's just that, just, just that guy. And, uh, and, and because just, if not everybody can teach. No one has that gift, and that's okay. Thank God there are people that do. And so say, well, I can't teach, or I can't sing, or I can't, hey, hey, you know what everybody can do? Everybody can be faithful. That's why everybody can be faithful. There's one thing that all of us can do. That's why faithfulness, that's why the Lord said, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards, that's us, that a man be found faithful. Now, he didn't say it's suggested. He didn't say it's highly recommended. He said it is required that a man be found faithful. What we admire in people, God requires in Christians. God requires it, that we be faithful. And it's a quality that God requires. So what are some areas we, we should be faithful? Well, we should be faithful, first of all, to our family. Faithfulness begins at home. You need to be faithful to your spouse, faithful to your children. I mean, dependable, reliable, count on that. Don't, don't get married to your job. Don't get married to your friends. Be married to your wife. Be married to your husband. By the way, don't get married to your children. But there are couples that get divorced after 25 years of marriage, 30 years of marriage. What happened? They poured their lives into their children and never, never spent any time with each other. And then guess what? Children leave home. And then they look at each other and say, who are you? And then they say, well, that's not the man I married or that's not the woman I married. And no kidding, nobody is the same person they were 30 years ago. Okay? But you need to, you need to not let, eat, don't even let children come before. Because what, listen, God made it the right way. You're supposed to have you're supposed to be a husband and a wife before you have children. Okay? And don't lose that priority. That's the order, the proper order that God made it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so we're to, we're to, we understand that he loved the church, he loves us with a sacrificial love. And so I understand there's nothing, listen, there's nothing so precious, there's nothing that would be so important to me that I shouldn't be willing to give that up for my spouse. That that would not be more important than what my spouse is. No, no boat, no job, no golf outing. Though Paul was a golfer, he said he finished the course. I don't care. You're going to hear the Bible when you're here whether you want to or not, all right? Faithfulness is a great quality, and it begins at home. So be faithful 
to your home. Faithful to your family. Then be faithful in our finances. Be faithful in our finances. Oftentimes you get a question or people pose the question, what would you do if you got a million dollars? Somebody, one guy said, I know what I'd do. I'd put it towards my debts as far as it'd go. <laughs> I hope that's not your problem. Can I tell you, can I tell you what you do with a million dollars? You do exactly with what you're doing with a hundred dollars now. You do exactly with what you're doing with ten dollars now. Whatever you're doing now is the same thing you do if you had a million dollars. Because if you're not faithful in what you have now, you won't be faithful if you got a million dollars. You say, well, I don't believe that, Pastor. Uh, let's look and see what Jesus said. Uh, Luke chapter 16. If you don't believe me, you'll believe Jesus, won't you? Luke 16. Luke chapter 16. Notice with me verse number 10, would you please? The Bible says, He that is faithful, now this is Jesus speaking, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So Jesus is saying, If I can't trust you with a little, how can I trust you with a lot? Why would I trust you with a lot? Because I have to be able to trust you with the little. It's, it is the little things that count. Don't mistake that. One fellow said to his wife, I think, I think our kids got my brains. And the wife replied, I'm sure they did. It's the little things that count. <laughs> so, notice, notice in verse 10 now, Luke 16, notice verse 11. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, What's the unrighteous mammon? Money. The filthy lucre, as the Bible calls it in other places. It's the money of this world. So if you haven't been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? The true riches, the spiritual riches that God wants to do. So the test of my faithfulness in the spiritual realm is what I do with my finances in the physical realm. Boy, that's quiet. Many times we're deprived of spiritual blessings because we're not, we have not been good stewards of the physical blessings God's given to us. And particularly in the handling of the money. Not just the tithe. I'm not just talking about giving to God what's His, though that's part of that. But God isn't, God isn't saying just make sure you give me 10% and then go live beyond your means otherwise. God's saying, let make sure that you, you, you we're, we're, we're stewards of all that He gives to us. Not just what we give back to Him, but what's left over. And we have to give an account for that as well. That we've been good stewards of what He's entrusted to us. The truth is, some people don't understand the Bible. And don't grow spiritually as they ought because they're unfaithful financially to do what God tells them to do and live the way God tells them to live. God says you don't go anywhere till you pass this test of being faithful in that which is least. And, and listen, to God, the money is the least of it. You think, you think God's really concerned about money? We, we get concerned about that, but that's not a concern to God. God, God, they, they pave the streets of heaven with gold. It's asphalt to them. We worship it here, but it's no, no, big, no consequence in heaven. So God's not concerned about that. The, the money isn't the issue, the money's the test. And so I, I need, listen, I don't know about you, but I need wisdom and I need power. And I need understanding. And so I want to be faithful in my finances. And be faithful steward of what's, what God's given me to do. Alright, so I'm faithful to the family. Faithful with the finances. And then we're to be faithful to the fellowship. The Bible has much to say 
about faithfulness to church. Notice Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Would you turn there? Romans chapter 12. You doing all right? Romans chapter 12. We're very familiar with verses 1 and 2. Let's start with verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, that's seriously, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office or the same function. So we, now here it is, verse 5, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. You see, you don't don't think of yourself too highly, verse 3, because you're part of something bigger than that. And you're just a part of a body. Your, Your arm or your hand can get to thinking it's really something. Try cutting it away from the body and see how good it works. Okay? And sometimes we get to people thinking, by the way, people get to thinking, I'm, I'm good, I can function well, I don't need church. That's like, that's like saying to your hand or to your arm, I don't need my body. Well, cut it off, see how it works. And that's about how good a Christian works who doesn't belong to a body of Christ. And doesn't belong to a local church. You're as much a part of me as I'm a part of you. And we're members one of another. When when the body meets and you're not here, we're missing a body part. And I don't care who you are, you don't function as well when you're missing one of the body parts. We can limp by. You can get by for one service or so. But man, when it continually happens, it hurts the function of the body. And we're not as effective as what we should be. That's why many churches are limping along. We need one another. That's why Hebrews 10 and verse number 25. Hebrews 10 and verse number 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You say, preacher, there's just a lot of people today that just don't want to go to church. There must have been back in that day too. Because he said, as the manner of some is. So they must have had those folks back then too. They, don't want to fors- they wanted to forsake the assembling of themselves together, as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the Bible says here we're, we're to be assembling ourselves together and not looking for ways to get there less, but ways to get there more more assembling together and exhorting one another while we're there. Somebody says, well, I just get as much out of nature or on the lake or with my family at the park. But you see, they're really revealing their heart and really the heart of the problem. Because here's, here's, what, here's the fallacy of that. You don't just come to church for what you get. You come to church for what you give. You're not just here to say, all right, I'm here, bless me. Huh? That's not what church is for. You come and say, hey, I didn't get anything out of that service. No, 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 no. Did you come to get or did you come to give? Did you come to put in or did you just come to take out? You understand? You, you have to reveal that you're here to give. What did Jesus say? The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. That's what Jesus said. And I think there's a few verses that say we're supposed to be like Him. So we're not here to be served, we're here to serve. We're here to do what God wants us to do. Exhorting one another is encouraging one another. How many of you know it's encouraging? Hey, be honest. How many of you are encouraged when you come to church and you see it filled up? Huh? Isn't that encouraging? You ever walked into church and there's only a handful of people here and you, your heart kind of drops? Or you say, where is everybody? 
You ever had those words go through your mind, if not out of your mouth? <laughs> huh? Yeah. And, 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 you have to, and you wonder, all right? Where to exhort, you exhort somebody. Hey, you're encouraging somebody just by coming. Just by being in your place. By being in your seat. Most of you have certain seats. You can kind of tell where you are. You sit pretty much the same place all the time. And you look and see, and I can, I can sit up here and look pretty quick and tell, uh-oh, where are they? Uh-oh, they're not here tonight. Oh, they're not here this morning. And you can kind of begin to tell uh, where people are. You wonder, well, I hope everything's okay. I wonder, wonder what happened to them. And so be, be, be careful. Listen, when it's most difficult to get to church, it is most necessary to get to church. If you've been in, you've been saved any length of time. There's been times when it seems like the the, 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 the you know everything everything happens. Uh, the devil will throw everything at you, but the kitchen sink, so to speak, to keep you from coming to the service. But if you persevere and you you determine, she said, "I'm going to be there." You find out God had something for you that service, and there was a reason that the enemy was throwing up the roadblocks to keep you from coming. That's why oftentimes when people come in the office and they say, oh, I need a few minutes to talk with you, and they, they talk to me about a problem, and, and I sit down and I say, you know, I just spoke about that Sunday night. It happened today on the telephone. And I had to talk about Sunday morning and Sunday night sermon to someone who was not here Sunday morning or Sunday night. They missed it. See? And, and, and so you, 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 you just you, you have to not miss it. I can, I can point to sermons, and if you've been saved any length of time, you can do the same thing. I can point to some messages through my life that have changed my life, that, that, are, that, are, that are things that I heard, truths that I heard where God did a work in my heart, and, 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 I've made, and I've been different because of that preaching. Now, here is the key to that whole thing. I was there to hear it. I was there to hear it. When, when I surrendered to, to be what God wanted me to be and to, to preach the gospel or whatever He wanted me to do, it was in a January in, uh, in, in 1977 at Canton Baptist Temple. Cold and who knows what else in the middle of January in northeastern Ohio. But guess what? It was Sunday morning and we went to church. I didn't get up saying, hey, this will be the day God's going to touch my heart and I'm going to surrender to do something for Him. I had no thought like that in my mind at all as far as I know. I was just going to church. But God had something in mind that day. But that's because I was there. You can't, you can't, you know, how many times you heard somebody say, boy, I heard you had a good service. Hmm? You ever heard people say that to you? I heard, I heard, boy, I heard I really missed a good one the other night. Yeah. And you ever try to, no matter how much you try, you can't relive that. And, and you can go watch it online, but it ain't the same as being there. I said, you can watch it online. I'm thankful those are watching online. But it doesn't take the place of being in church. It can't. It's just not the same. And so be faithful. Be faithful. There's times that you're just here and God's going to ring your bell just because you're here. And you're, you're, you're faithful. And He's going to give you something that you really, really need. And so I think you're saying, listen, you're saying, first of all, when you come faithfully, you're telling God, God, what you said is important to me. But you're telling every other member of this church when you come here faithfully, you're important to me. I realize I'm part of a bigger thing than just me. I'm part of a body and I need to be here. And then you're, 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 you're letting people know that they're important and that, that you, you want them. And by the way, <laughs> it's selfish to skip church and just say it won't hurt me to skip church. Number one, first of all, it will hurt you. But it hurts other people too. It hurts other people when they don't see you here. How do, I, how do, I, how do we encourage the new Christians who get saved and we tell them now you need to be in church and be faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night and they come back Sunday night and half the people don't show up again. What message does that send to them? Oh, well, I guess 
I guess you really don't have to be here. Huh? And so we, we have to make sure that we're not hurting somebody else by not being faithful. So it will hurt you and it will hurt others too. So be faithful to the fellowship. Be faithful in finances. Be faithful in your family. And then be faithful to the faith. Talking about the Word of God. Talking about God's Word. There's some people today that are casting doubt on parts of God's Word. Don't, don't ever put a question mark where God's put a period. Okay? When God says it, if God says it, huh, then, then I believe it. That's it. If God is against it, so am I. If God's for it, so am I. The Bible's right, the Bible's true, and let's obey what the Bible says. Don't try to find a way around it. Don't try to rationalize it away. We're supposed to let the Word of God judge us. So William Booth, who is founder of the Salvation Army, both when it preached salvation and it was an army, it's neither one today. But he was the founder of the Salvation Army. He said the chief danger of the 20th century, we're in the 21st century, he said the chief the, 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 the chief danger of the 20th century will be this. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. And heaven without hell. It's amazing. He said in the 1800s. He saw that coming well, well ahead of time. And we live in that day. Our generation's lost. The modern church is lost. And so it's ever a time we need faithful people. Listen, people to be faithful to the faith, it's now. People to be faithful to live the Bible. Not just, not just come to church and act like a Christian and then live the way we want the rest of the week. Oh, the, world, the world's seen enough hypocrisy. It's time to see some true Christians. People who are faithful to the faith. First thing we see when we look into the heart of the Apostle Paul is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Are you faithful to your family, to finances, to fellowship, to the faith? Are you faithful? Secondly, the second thing we see when we look into his heart, back in Acts chapter 20 again. Acts chapter 20, verse number 19 serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. The second thing we see in Paul's heart is humility. Humility. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind with many tears and temptations. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 for I am the least of the apostles and I'm not meek to be called an apostle, or I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Again, in Ephesians 3 and verse 8, he said, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. And in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul was humble. Humbleness, humility means you're aware that you're unworthy. You're aware that you're unworthy. You understand that apart from Christ, you can do nothing. You're aware of that. It's not, nobody accomplishes things just on talent. You accomplish things with the touch of God on your life. It's not, not, not ability or charisma. But it's so easy when God blesses us. God, God, God pours out His blessing on us to get an overinflated opinion of ourselves. And we begin to glory in it instead of giving glory to God. Like the flea that was on the back of an elephant that crossed over a wooden bridge. And the flea whispered in the elephant's ear, did you feel that bridge move when we walked across it? Thinking that he's something. Humility. God working through you and me. 
But don't get puffed up about that. The woodpecker was working on a tree, and then as he was pecking away on the tree, the tree got struck by lightning, obliterating the tree into a smoking, splintery mess. He flew away in shock, but came back in a few minutes with five other woodpeckers and said, there it is, boys, right over there. And if we're not careful, that's how we get when God does something big. And we get to looking, hey, look at what we did. We didn't do anything. God does that. God does that. We get to thinking we've done something. No, he, he that is mighty hath done great things. And it's to be glory to his name. Not glory to our name. Glory to his name. Without him, we can do Nothing. Paul says, look at, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Would you look there please? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you doing alright? We're, we're not far from being done. 2 Corinthians 3. Brother Wallace informed me Sunday, he said there's sometimes he just wishes that, you know, there was one of these slots up here that he said I could put a quarter in and get 15 more minutes. I thought, well, I know what I'm worth now anyway. <laughs> About a quarter for 15 minutes worth, huh? Thanks for not saying amen anyway, all right? 2 Corinthians 3. Verse 5, notice what Paul writes here. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency, what's the rest of it, church? Is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter, the letter is the law. The letter is my power. When I'm doing it in my power, I, I'm, I'm, I get very pharisaical and I want everybody to, to, to do it just like I do it. Because that's, that's my way. That's my pride. You know, he said, you're doing it by the Spirit's power. Law is man doing the work. Grace is God doing the work. We're not under the law. We're under grace. The Spirit does the work through us. That's what he's saying. We, we are made able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and graven in stones, was glorious, and that's the law, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. He came down from the mountain, was talking to them, and they couldn't even look at him because his face shone so bright. That wasn't the gospel he was given. That was the law he was given. And that's how glorious that was. But, but by the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Okay? And so that's going to be done away. Look in verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Man, if the law was that great and the law made his face shine, how much more should the gospel of the grace of God make our countenance shine? And people see that in our life. But it's not by my power. It's not by my might. It's by the Spirit's power. It's by allowing the Holy Spirit to, to use me. It doesn't mean that you, you don't work hard. It doesn't mean that you don't put the effort. But you understand, it's not my power that gets it done. It's God's power. So I see humility. Faithfulness, humility. The third thing we see back in Acts 20, when we look into the heart of the Apostle Paul, is compassion. Compassion. Notice again in verse 19, he said, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by lying way to the Jews, with many tears. Some men think it's not very manly to cry. But Paul was no weak-minded man. Paul was no crybaby, but he could weep. And Jesus wept. And he was a man's man. Paul 
was brave and bold and he withstood some incredible things for God. You read again 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Beaten and tortured and imprisoned and stoned. But he never backed up and he never backed down. He never gave up, but he never gave in. He was a tough, tough guy. In spite of all that toughness, he had a compassion, had a tenderness with tears. There's three things that he mentions that brought him to tears. Three things that brought Paul to tears. Number one, the first thing was backslidden Christians. Backslidden Christians. Christians who were living in sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 4, he wrote this, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, that ye might, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. He says, I'm writing with tears and I'm writing with grief. And by the way, he's writing to the church at Corinth who, who he just spent all of 1 Corinthians, for lack of a better term, ripping their face off. I mean, chastising them. They were wrong on everything. And he had corrected in every single chapter is him correcting him about what they're, what they're wrong about. And he's saying, man, I didn't enjoy writing that to you. I didn't enjoy having to correct you like that. He said, that, that, that brought anguish to my heart. So he was grieved over the carnality. You get grieved over folks who are carnal. You get grieved in your heart over Christians that are sinning? When's the last time you wept over someone who was away from God? When's the last time you wept over someone who was backslidden? Cried out to God on their behalf instead of gossip about them or talk to someone else about them and say, well, yeah, I knew I saw that coming. Well, I knew that's what happened to them. doesn't touch our heart at all. Hmm? When's the last time you went to someone who was away from God and with tears begged them to get right with God? And begged them to come back to God? Hmm? Paul wept at backslidden Christians. Paul wept, secondly, at false teachers. False teachers. If you remember in Acts 20, we read about when he said he commended them to the grace of God. And um, Oh, I'm sorry. In uh, verse number 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Ghost made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. Broke his heart to think about people who would depart the faith. People who would, not just from the outside, but even from the inside. It always, I was talking to Brother Yoder, we, we grew up in the same church in, uh, up in Canton. It always, and, and, and by the way, a church now that, I don't even know what they run on Sunday morning, uh, maybe a thousand, I don't know if they hit a thousand now or not, but when the days we were there, it would not be unusual to have four thousand there on a Sunday. Said, so where'd all those other three thousand people go? I don't know where all they went, but I, it grieves me when I hear that some of them are going to church and they don't even go to a Baptist church. Some of them go to churches where they believe you have to be baptized to be saved. Others going to church that just have a Sunday morning service, no Sunday night, no Wednesday night, nothing else, just go one hour on Sunday morning. You have to understand something. When I was growing up, uh, and and you go back into the '60s and and even in the early '70s. The only people I knew that went to church one time a, one time a week were, were Catholic. And if they didn't want it to interfere with, you know, their weekend, they just kind of got the hour in on Saturday night so they could go on out and do what they wanted to do and then, you know, be okay the rest of the week. Is that right, Ann Moreland? Yeah. 
That's what she did. But, but now, that's where, that's where Christian churches are. Grace my heart. Listen, if, if, if there ever comes a time when you have to, to leave Bible Baptist Church, listen, join another good Bible-believing Baptist church. Okay? Sometimes God will move people. I understand that. I don't, I don't, I don't ever like it. I don't ever like it and say, oh, bless God, those people left. I, I, don't, I don't ever want to say that. that it hurts. You, you lose part of your body, it hurts. <laughs> and so I, I, don't, I don't ever rejoice in that. But, 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 man, I don't want you to go to somewhere where there's false doctrine. Be aware of that. Don't be blown about by every wind of doctrine. And so it was false teachers. Recently, there was a fellow on television that said he didn't believe that God would send anybody to hell. And again, people who, false teachers. And, and people want to hear that. They want to hear that I'm okay. It doesn't matter how I live. But that kind of heresy brought Paul to tears. Grieved him. So Paul wept over backslidden Christians. He wept over false teachers. And then the third thing is he wept at the thought of people going to hell. Would you look at Romans chapter 9 and we'll be done. Romans chapter 9. Notice verses 2 and 3. Well, let's start with verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish, I, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That's an amazing statement. That I could wish myself accursed from Christ so that my kinsmen, according to the flesh, could be saved. That I, I'm willing to die and go to hell if those people could go to heaven. That's, that's an amazing statement. Would you ever say that about anybody? Would you ever say that about your spouse or your child or your mother or your father? How badly do we really want to see people say? He's not, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that you can get saved for somebody else. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say you can get baptized for somebody else. But it does say you can pray for somebody else. You can weep for somebody else. And you can give the gospel to somebody else. It does say that. Don't wait until you see your loved one lying in a coffin and then shed tears for them. It's too late for that. Weep for them now. Psalm 126, 5 and 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Oh, go! I'm afraid we're good at going and we're good at giving the gospel, but we kind of leave out the tears, the weeping that goes with it. The songwriter said, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep or the erring one. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Compassion. Jude said, Of some have compassion, making a difference. So when I look into the heart of Paul, I see faithfulness. I see humility. And I see compassion. That's what, that's what I want to have in my heart. That's what I want to ask God to cultivate in my heart. No special talent necessary. Just a willingness to let God do spiritual surgery. Do spiritual operation on us and make us more like Christ. May God help us to do that. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for Acts 20. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to look into the heart of the Apostle Paul. So many things we could, could see as we look into that heart. But these three character qualities of faithfulness and humility, compassion, 
cultivate those in our hearts. Help us to be faithful. Help us to realize our unworthiness. And that our sufficiency is not of ourselves, it is of God. Help us to have compassion. Give us the tender heart that we must have. For the backslidden Christian, for those who would teach false doctrine, and for those who are lost and perishing and on their way to hell. May they care about what we know because they know how much we care. Now, Father, help us to live these truths in our lives. Cultivate them in us, please, that we might be pleasing in your sight. And we'll thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful? Hey, it's Miss Slaybaugh's birthday. If you see her, say happy birthday to her, all right? All right, ready? Ah, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up.